Today we're doing a standalone sermon. This is one all by itself. Uh, it's not a part of a series. Today we are on the first Sunday of the month, and if you've been here very long, you know that we partake of communion as a church on the first Sunday of the month. And we've been making some changes practically to the way that we as a church family observe communion. And there's even a degree to which we're making some changes today that you'll see towards the end of service. After the sermon is done, we're going to partake in communion together. But I wanted to take an opportunity to preach and teach it from Scripture, um, to remind ourselves of the importance of it, as well as let us see kind of why We're making some of the changes that we are um, relative to communion. So the passage that we'll be reading from today is in 1 Corinthians. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and turn there. If you do not have a Bible, we have shelves on the two back corners of the rooms that have Bibles on them. You can go grab one and read and follow along with that or use your smartphone or whatever. If you don't own a Bible, please go grab one and take it home. We want you to have a Bible and we would be thrilled to give one of those to you. Today in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to start in just a moment in verse 17, but uh, as we jump ahead uh, to our reading in verse 17, the tone of the Corinthians, this is a letter that Paul wrote, and we're just jumping into the middle of the letter. But this is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. That's, it's the first letter that he wrote to the church in Corinth. That's why it's called 1 Corinthians. And in the middle of this letter, a letter in which he says some kind and encouraging things, he gives some admonitions, um, he, he tells them how much he loves them and all that kind of stuff. It's also a letter that the larger percentage of it is rebuke, where he's correcting them. Now, I'm not getting up here to just go <laughs> today. I'm not trying to set that precedent necessarily. But in the midst of this letter that is majoritively rebuke, there are some places where in chapter 11, the first parts of chapter 11, he's commending them. And he's commending them for staying true to the things that he had taught them the last time that he was there. Yet, this part where we're about to jump in on verse 17 is where we're going to see him shift back once more to a tone of rebuke and correction. And a lot of the rebuke and correction that we find in the first uh, Corinthians, the letter that Paul wrote, a lot of that correction is around division that they have found in the church where Paul's hearing this about these people, hearing these things. He's also been correcting them about sexual immorality. He's been correcting them about their perspective on divorce. He's been correcting them about all sorts of things. Right now, Um, We're going to look at the way in which uh, he addresses one aspect of division and the way that it's working out in their partaking of the Lord's table. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, Paul says this, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you. He had just finished commending them. In the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. Yikes, can you imagine if he was saying that to us, to our church today, if we got a letter from the Apostle Paul and I'm reading it to all of you and he says, hey, when you're coming together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. We'd be going, oh, yikes. What's that about? Going on in verse 18, he says, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Okay, a few things here. Number one, Paul wants to make it a point to rebuke them for their division, and he makes it clear. He says, what I am about to talk to you guys about, I don't commend you in this. I just commended you on some things. I want to make it really clear right now what I'm about to talk to you about is not commendable. Again, you'd be sitting here going, yay, can't wait to see what he says next. Second, he realizes though that there actually is an appropriate place and time for a dividing line. There is an appropriate place and time for division. And before you hear that and you go, wait, wait, you're saying there's a right time for division? In a sense, yes, and that's what he said when he said, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. So how does he define right there where division is appropriate? Well, it's by those who are genuine in faith 
and those who are illegitimate in faith. In fact, if you read earlier in the letter, you would read Paul correcting and rebuking and condemning some sexual immorality that had pervaded into the church. And about one of the people, he says, man, there's even, I'm hearing that there's some who have taken their father's wife in sexual immorality. And, and so to that, he says, and to that person, cast them out from among you that their flesh may be destroyed, that their soul may be saved. Man, this is fun, yippity stuff to talk about this morning, isn't it? He said, if there's someone who's participating in those acts, separate that they may find and feel the consequences of their sin that might wake them up and bring them to repentance that they might find salvation is what Paul is explaining earlier in the letter. And so Paul right here now is saying, I can understand why there would be divisions or factions among you between genuine and illegitimate believers. Saying, hey, if if there are those among you who are practicing and living in sexual immorality or other different issues that he's brought up, that is a point where we should draw a dividing line and not just go, okay, hey, you do you, buddy. No, that's a point where we go, mm, we got to divide over this. In other places where he, in this letter, is saying, um, Hey, hey, you know, I've aimed to not preach to you with lofty words of man's wisdom, but I've aimed to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. That's all I want to preach is I want to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified for sin. Similarly there, if there's someone who's preaching a different message, that's a proper place for division. If someone's preaching something other than Jesus Christ crucified as the Savior of the world, that's a point where we should divide. That's a line that we should draw, that Jesus Christ crucified, paid for our sin on the cross. That is a worthy point of division. Let's look again um, as we continue on now in verse 20 of this example or manifestation of the division that Paul is honing in on. Verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. I love this next sentence. What? (laughs) The one word sentence with an exclamation point. I I I love that. Paul just goes, what? That some are, are eating before everyone else and some are going without because of that and some are getting drunk. And to that he just goes, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Now, I want to give a little bit of a history lesson here. If you're struggling to put the pieces together about why Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper and also talking about how some are eating their own meal, not waiting for others, and some are getting drunk, and some aren't getting to eat any at all. And you're thinking, wait a minute, we, we do communion once a month at Word of Grace. We do it once a month. And the way that we do communion, I'm struggling to reconcile what I'm reading here and how someone could eat ahead of everyone else and get their full and someone else grow hungry and someone could get drunk because we've had these um, weird little wafers that I think are made from styrofoam and, and how someone would have an opportunity to eat a meal and be full, yet someone else not get. How's that work? Well, there are some senses or, or ways in which practically the way that we observe communion in many modern Western churches is, is deviated quite a bit from the way that communion was observed and partaken in in the first century in the era in which Paul and the apostles lived. And so, um, so they would partake in communion on a weekly basis. 
Not on a monthly basis. They did it every single week when they gathered together on their weekly gathering. And sometimes I think maybe we should pray and consider that. And if you're going, oh, man, communion every week, that would, oh. Man, I would really encourage you to search your heart about communion and what it's for. Because it's something that we are supposed to delight in and, and, and revel in and reflect in and worship in and give glory to God in. And if there's the part of our heart and mind that goes, oh man, that sounds like something that would become a boring part of the service if we did it every week. I'd almost be like less, <laughs> less severe or more severe than what I'm about to say. It would almost be like saying, oh man, I, I have to spend time with my spouse every week. <sighs> If you know and love the Lord, if you have received his lavish grace, communion is meant to be a beautiful, wonderful, holy thing for us. And if it's not, shame on us. So one, they would partake in communion every single week. I'm not necessarily saying that we're doing that, but I'm definitely praying and flirting with it. Maybe we should. The other thing that they would do the way that they partook in communion was not only was it on a weekly basis, but it was also in the midst or part of a full meal. And now you're like, well, I definitely am in for every week. <laughs> but it was part of their weekly gathering. If you read in Acts chapter 2 where Peter stands up in front of the thousands of people and preaches this, this gospel sermon that cuts them to the heart and they all say, what must we do to be saved? And he says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And, the, and then it says that thousands were added to the church that day and then explains what their church was like after that. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread and the fellowship, and to the prayers. That was a little nutshell of what church, the weekly gathering, looked like at the birth of the church. We're talking Acts chapter 2. And so in their weekly gathering, and as we see evidenced right here by what Paul is addressing and rebuking and correcting with the Corinthian church, was that in their weekly gathering, yes, they would devote themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to one another and the fellowship and the breaking of bread, a full meal, and to prayer. Now, I don't know that I'm saying let's start doing a fellowship every Sunday, but maybe a lot more. I'm just telling you guys right now, I'm thinking about, praying about, man, maybe we should actually do a fellowship like once a month. Because I think sometimes the disconnection and the disunity that can happen in a church is because we don't walk enough in biblical pictures of fellowship. Like when you sit and eat with somebody, when you break bread and you share in each other's lives and you tell stories and you crack jokes and you laugh about your week or you cry about your week, and it creates unity in a way that, that what we do right now definitely creates unity, but it creates more when we're fellowshipping together that way. So I would encourage you, at every opportunity when we have things like that, wherein it is an opportunity to invest in connection and fellowship and unity with the local church body, don't go, eh, that's not really my thing. The early church devoted themselves to it. And it's something I think we should wrestle with. Okay, where were we? Back to verse 20. I'll read this again. When you come together, it's not the Lord's supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? This is like Paul saying, listen, if you want to eat or drink with your buddies, do that at your home. There's places for that. But our weekly worship gathering, that is not a place for classes or division. In case you're not picking up here, what was happening historically in this element 
is that the wealthy did not like fellowshipping with the unwealthy. And they began arranging, conspiring kind of together to come earlier than the poor so that they could fellowship together, enjoy their steak, and leave the ground beef for the poor, if anything. Because Paul said, man, there's even some who are going hungry. And it was a, there was a, a faction in the church that was going, ah, we don't want to fellowship with those Christians. Paul is condemning that. And he's making the point that this is the Lord's table, not your table. And the Lord's table has plenty of chairs for everyone. And the Lord is glorified when this diversity that we have of background, diversity of wealth, diversity of race, diversity of life experience, when all those come together and hold the bread and the cup representative of our one Savior, his one sacrifice, in which that body, that bread, that one loaf, which we'll read about in a moment, binds us all together in Christ. And if we're seeking out opportunities to separate, shame on us. To this he says, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? Can you imagine being the one who has nothing to bring to the potluck? Can you imagine being the one who's fell on hard times and you're scrapping your bits together and you're trying to make ends meet and you're thinking, man, the whole church is coming together. Thank the Lord that it's a potluck, a fellowship, that everybody's bringing something. Maybe it won't shine the light on the fact that I don't have anything to bring. And you get there and people chose to go ahead of you and eat before you and you get there and there's nothing left. What would that feel like? Would that feel like you're a part of the body of Christ? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Paul rebukes them because they took a beautiful, unifying act of worship and did it in a way that he would soon call, in a moment, he would call it an unworthy manner. Whew. It's the Lord's table, not our table, not your table. And there's a seat for everyone. Continuing on in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul is reminding them why we even partake in communion. The fact that they've taken this beautiful act of worship, this beautiful act of unity, this sacrament commanded and instituted by the Lord Jesus, and they've twisted it and, and perverted it and, and used it to create divisions and disunity in the church. He says, hey, do you remember why we even do this? Is what he's doing right here, saying, remember what I, what I first delivered to you, which was delivered to me, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it and he said, take and eat because this is my body broken for you. He, and similarly, he gave the cup and said, take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of our sins. The why behind it affects the how we do it. Man, there's got to be a reverence in this. There's got to be a sense of holy wonder in it. And if we're just casual going, oh yeah, the thing with the cup and the bread, and we'll do the thing and we'll, we'll all that. Yep, yeah, cool, it's part of what we do. Man, it's a holy thing. It's a sacred thing. He corrects their sin by reminding them of the sacrifice of Jesus saying, as often as we eat, 
this bread and drink the cup. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. It's an awkward pause, right? I just don't want to rush past that. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup, meaning after examining ourselves. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why so many of you are weak and ill And some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, meaning if we examined ourselves and judged ourselves for our sin, confessed it, repented of it, and and turned away from it, if if we truly judged ourselves, verse 31, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be uh, condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers... When you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. It's not why we're doing this. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. So he says, when you come together, eat, wait for one another. And the heartbeat behind this statement is something that ought to be the heartbeat in what we do as the body of Christ, a desire to include and participate and share in our worship, our service, our care, all that we do as the body of Christ together. Paul says to the Corinthians, I have heard there are divisions among you. I'm not the Apostle Paul. I'm Pastor Stephen, Pastor of Word of Grace. But similarly, I want to say, I have heard there are divisions among you. When I hear about pockets of gossip, and I hear about people talking about things instead of going to people to talk about things to the one who has offended them or hurt them. It grieves me, it saddens me, it angers me. Even more than that, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And before you sit there thinking, whoa, who's he talking about? What's been going on that I haven't heard about? What don't I know? What we should be thinking when we hear something like this is, am I facilitating division? Am I participating in disunity? Am I doing those things? If you're, if, if you're sitting here going, well, I haven't heard of any of that, man, praise God, I'm so thankful, and let's fight to preserve unity. And I'll just keep looking up for a moment because I don't want anyone to think that I'm just like pointing at them or anything, but I will say that it really grieves me and frustrates me when we have gone into Scripture and we have seen what Scripture says about gossip and I hear about pockets of it. What a comfortable and fun message this morning. It grieves the Lord. It grieves the Holy Spirit. Gossip is a sin that Jesus paid for. Slander is a sin that Jesus died on the cross for. And our church, as a local church, ought to be a picture of the unity that Jesus Christ himself prayed for. Amen? And so, 
I'll say this once more. Man, if you ever have something against another believer, go to them. Go to them. No one else, because here's why it's so cancerous and so dangerous. Because so many times I've seen and heard where people can be upset about something, talking to others about what they're upset about, they finally get to talk to the person that they were offended at, find out it was just a misunderstanding, and in the meantime, they've poisoned the hearts and minds of other people, and they realize they were wrong, and now other people are against that other person. It's cancer in the church. And I'm, I'm just going to say I'm not going to tolerate it. I don't like doing this, and it's not fun but it doesn't glorify the Lord. And I was planning on just preaching communion today. I went to this passage thinking about, I wanted to get to where we're talking about the one loaf and the unity that's represented in the one loaf, and we're gonna get there. But I have to take a moment to just address that. And again, I hope that there's plenty of you who are sitting there going, man, I have no clue what he's talking about. Praise God, let that be the case from now on. But, if the Lord is convicting you and the Holy Spirit is confronting you of having participated in or not snuffed out when you've heard it or having not um, opposed it or, or permitting it when gossip has taken place, let the Lord soften our hardened hearts. And I'll say this, don't ever let someone else make up your mind for you about someone else either. That's another reason that gossip is so, so dangerous. And further, if you're unwilling to talk to someone about the offense you have with them, and this is where sometimes people come to me to talk to me about challenges that they have and they need to process it with someone else, and I wouldn't call that gossip. And, and I think that's an okay thing to do as long as we're guarding our hearts and we're seeking advice and counsel with someone who can trust that will not facilitate or, or um, uh, partake in gossip. But when someone comes to me about someone else, my, my, my final question I always want to ask is, okay, now that you've shared this through me and hopefully you've processed through that experience or your opinion or per your perspectives, my next question will be, when are you going to go to them? When are you going to go talk to them? And, and, and more often than not, probably eight out of 10 times, what I hear when I ask that is, oh, no, you know what? It's fine. It's not that big of a deal. I, I, I think I can leave it behind me. Man, that's glorifying to God. Praise God. That's like what Jesus did on the cross when they're crucifying and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. To just choose to forgive without even having to work through manual reconciliation. But then to have said that and not leave it behind but pick it up again does not glorify the Lord. And so sometimes people won't go to someone because uh, they know they don't really have ground to stand on when they, with what they want to talk about. <laughs> and sometimes it's because people are scared to do that. Listen. The ministry of reconciliation is what the Lord has given to us, where he's reconciled us to himself. And that same ministry, we reconcile to one another. Okay. Let's try and get happy now. <clears throat> if we do not delight in the unity God gives the church in our diversity, in our differences, it is because we have either not seen or have lost sight of the wonder and the magnitude of our salvation. Let's read that again. Look at that on the screens. If we do not delight in the unity God gives the church in our diversity, it is because we have either not seen or have lost sight of the wonder and the magnitude of our salvation. We've lost sight of what communion represents. We've lost sight of the gravity of our sin, the way that our sin separated us from God, the ways in which we were dead in sin, but the body and the blood of Christ were given that we might be forgiven. 
And if we are forgiven and reconciled to God, we are to reconcile to each other. If, if we don't revel in and delight in the way that we can look around this room and see all the differences and go, man, me and that person, even though we're different, we love each other and we're unified together and we're joined together in the Holy Spirit by the blood of Christ, by the body of Christ, to the glory of Christ. If that's not our heart, it's because we have either never seen or we have lost sight of the magnitude of our salvation. We've let it become diminished or we've never even seen it in the first place. How great of a salvation it is. And I'll, I'll go back to, you guys might be tired of it, my, my favorite movie of all time, The Lord of the Rings. And if you went to the first movie, The Fellowship of the Ring, yeah, I'm a nerd, who cares? If you watch The Fellowship of the Ring, you'll see they've got this ring that's evil and they're trying to get it to Mount Doom to destroy it so they can save all of uh, mankind. And um, there's this evil... Uh, evil guy named Sauron. But you know what? I can't get into all the details. It's too much. But there's this council called with good people who are men and some who are dwarves and some who are elves. Yes, we're talking real nerd level stuff, okay? And they come together and there's these divisions among them. It's like the elves don't like the dwarves who don't like the men and all around and they're sitting there bickering at each other. Yet they have to come to realize that they have a common enemy and a common goal to accomplish. And then they put together this team that's mixed up of men and elves and dwarves to go on this journey to try and conquer evil. Three books later, three movies later, lots of fighting and lots of dying and lots of sacrifice, lots of tears and hardship later through this massive journey. Through deep darkness, they finally conquer the enemy. Sorry, spoiler alert if you haven't watched them. They finally conquer the enemy and destroy the ring. And you see among these different hobbits and humans and dwarves and elves a love for each other. Where at first the dwarf and the elf are cracking, making uh, bitter remarks at each other. And it comes to the point where one of them says, how do you feel about fighting next to an elf? To the dwarf. And the dwarf says, I, next to a friend. That doesn't have to be fiction. Right? We have a worthy cause. The commission to take the gospel forward and make disciples of all nations. There is no more worthy cause. Amen? Our cause is worthy. And even if not just for the cause, the Holy Spirit of God unites us together. And how much more is God glorified by a bunch of different and diverse people coming together in unity to worship and glorify God? What I want us to see today is that communion is a symbol of unity and a tool for unity. I'm going to jump back one chapter to read three verses. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14, Paul says this to the same people. He says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry, I speak as to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. Bread. 